Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to legislative administration. Uh, a couple of quick bookkeeping notes. I was planning on welcoming our new our new representative to our committee, um, Jennifer Mendelbaum, um, but I don't see her, so I hope maybe she'll pop in later. Um, we do, so we have a replacement uh, for the rest of the term, which is probably one more meeting, um, <laughs> with uh, uh, and taking the place of Representative Dolan for the rest of the session. Um, aside from that, uh, we're at past 10 o'clock, so I will recognize um, co-prime co sponsor, um, uh, represent, uh, Senator Susi, um, for Senate Bill 605. Welcome to the Legislative Administration. Senator. Thank you very much, Chairman Hill, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Donna Susie. I represent Senate District 18, five wards in the city of Manchester in the town of Litchfield. Um, this was a, a late bill that Senator Bradley and I, the Senate President, worked on together. Um, he unfortunately has another 10 o'clock hearing, so we met in the elevator, and um, I hope that I can do it justice. Um, as probably many of you are aware, uh, the Legislative Ethics Committee has released some advisory opinions um, regarding when someone should recuse themselves. The first opinion led to a great deal of discussion amongst our members, some concerns about making sure that individuals had clarity and direction uh, about when they should recuse themselves from certain votes. So that led to some work with our Senate Legal Counsel to draft the bill that is before you today. Um, it is our belief that recusal is something that we should, as legislators, take very seriously and consider when we're looking at issues before us and the potential impact they have on us as individuals. The language before you is taken primarily from the IRS code, which has certain provisions um, that I will outline in just a moment about what substantial influence is. And I think that's really one of the issues. Um, we can all come up with, I'm sure, some examples where something is really attenuated. Somebody is employed by a company, but really has no influence over the decisions the company makes. I mean, they may be somebody who is a custodian for a, a major employer. They may be someone who works in billing. They have no influence over the decision making. And I think what our focus is was to really narrow down those instances where someone has a truly substantial interest. So I would call your attention to um, the paragraph begins on line 13, and then you will see it outlines three items starting on line 16. Um, about what substantial interest is. One is that, excuse me, I'm not, excuse me, the recusal, the substantial interest portion that I, I just pointed you to, um, you would have to be someone, it defines who that person is. So somebody who's a voting member of the governing body, one of the executives, so the president, chief officer, treasurer, or chief financial officer, someone who does have a lot of authority over the company. The recusal portion is actually the paragraph before, begins on line seven, um, and the circumstances start with line nine. So recusal in a situation where somebody receives financial remuneration from the organization, so paid from the organization, holds a position to exercise substantial influence over it, and the organization has lobbied, testified, or otherwise attempted to influence the outcome of legislation. It's not an or, it's all three. So you would have to be receiving funds from the organization, you would have to be someone who substantially influences the organization, and someone would have had to have testified or lobbied. So we believe the language is clear and very significantly narrows those instances where a legislator should recuse themselves from participation in legislation. Um, so with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, to the best of my ability. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, yes, Representative. Thank you for taking my question, Senator. Based on line 16, mm -hmm. since I am the chairman of the board of selectmen for the town of Northumberland, I wouldn't be able to vote on anything that pertains to municipalities because up on line six, six. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States, the state of New Hampshire, counties within the state, but municipalities aren't included in there. And just because I'm a board member, question. why should I be disqualified? Yeah. Thank you for that question, Representative. It is a good one because I think that applies to a number of people in our legislature. I, I will get back to you with the specific reference, but I believe there is actually a provision that exempts those from government and municipal organizations. That is another part of the chapter. Um, the issue, if I just may complete my answer, part of the reason this issue arose in the Senate is, for example, we have three members of the Senate that are employed by, well, two by the university system, one by the community college system. So the question came up, would those members be precluded from voting on the budget since the university system and others? And there was a legal determination made by our council, which I believe was presented to the Senate Ethics Committee, and I see former Justice and Representative Gordon here, who can, who's chair of that committee, who can explain, um, there is an exemption for those situations that already exists in the statute. And if that isn't clear from here, once I give you the site, that's something that we certainly would want to exempt. Sure, I'm sure. So would you have objections if municipalities were added to line six? right after counties? Um, I personally would not, okay. um, but I would, I'm speaking on my own behalf, I would obviously want okay. to consult with the Senate President as well as the prime sponsor of the bill. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? I have a couple, sure. um, if you don't mind. Not at all. Um, you may or may not be aware, uh, this committee has been working or struggling with this for three years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that we started coming to the table with was the, was the fundamental question of whether we are trying to um, provide guidance to the legislator who may be sitting in Division Three in the middle of a row and trying to figure out whether he, has, he or she has a problem um, with the bill that's before us and without having a, their attorney on speed dial um, having to answer whether they should be recusing themselves from that debate or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and judging that against the idea of whether this is more for the ethics committee to um, judge individual opinions, such as the one that you mentioned earlier with, uh, with the three instructors. Um, we're not, we, we kind of come down on both sides of that issue, whether, whether this is for the legislator to, to guide them or whether it is for punitive purposes or, or mm -hmm. judgmental purposes. So that's where we started. I guess my first question is, do you feel that this legislation, proposed legislation, puts us in a better category with either of those, one or the other. Thank you, Representative Hill, for the question. I, I think it does a bit of both. I think it provides clear guidance to the individual who is, as you said, confronted with an issue and is trying to work through whether or not they should specifically recuse. And as I said, they'd have to meet all three criteria. It's an and, not an or. Um, but I also think that the statute does not currently provide um, for the Legislative Ethics Committee to have very specific statutory guidance as to when recusal is clear. So I, I think it does both. It's not an effort to try to 
get people caught. It's an effort to try to better inform the individual legislator and to the extent the committee is rendering opinions about whether or not somebody may have violated the law. I think having something in statute is better than simply relying upon um, all of their previous opinions and upon the individual circumstances. And as I said, I, I do know that the chair of the committee is here and I'm sure we'll entertain those questions for you as well. And, and we have questions for them as mm -hmm. well. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I guess um, where I'm, uh, well, first of all, do you, would you know if um, Attorney Lehman had uh, went to the IRS regulations um, primarily or as a as a second source we in this committee we went mm -hmm. and looked at and, and reviewed what all of the other states do and mm -hmm. how how their wording is set up um, I, I think I'm safe in saying we didn't even look at what the IRS determines mm -hmm. um, so can you speak to why the IRS language was preferable um, actually, I cannot speak for him. Um, all I can tell you is that that was one of the references he indicated was used in developing, helping us to develop this legislation. Um, I, I think I'll have a conversation with, with Rick later on then. Certainly. Um, I wondered if, if the conversation or the question of whether we would need to change any part of um, uh, Part two, Article seven of the Constitution, where it talks about being of counsel. Do you th is that anything that came up in the Senate? In it any did of the not, Mr. Chairman. Okay, because I notice in I think it's page two, line. We get to line eleven, um, mm -hmm. where where we're um, tending to show no substantial influence. We've included attorneys in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it would seem to me that would run counter to Part 2, Article 7, where it specifically states being of counsel. Well, I, there are, I think I would answer that question in two ways. Um, being of counsel, the way the Constitution represents it, is, is different than it's a term of art used for currently um, the position an attorney might hold within a firm. There are those that are of counsel that are not, you know, substantially influenced but are affiliated with the firm. Um, I also think with respect to attorneys, um, there are, as you know, I'm sure well, Mr. Chairman, having considered these issues before, um, there are a number of other ethical issues um, regarding an attorney's representation of their client and further representation before the legislature. So that's something we would need to consider as well. I, I, I don't think the constitutional provision is implicated here, but certainly something we we did not consider and would be happy to work with the committee. Uh, following up on that, we it seems that the legislation gears more towards the employer-employee relationship. Um, and, and judging by the fact that the, I think the last four or five of the, of the opinions that were rendered by the Ethics Committee do center in on that employer-employee relationship, um, did the Senate, or, or in drafting this, um, did, was the consideration for those, those ethical considerations that are occurring outside that relationship um, was that something that you you seem to have focused only on the employer employee relationship um, is the rest of it fine as far as you're concerned well i think the rest of it if you're referring to other professions i think you're referring to those that provide service to an employer or to the organization as opposed to someone who has direct authority over an individual. Um, actually, I would say that what we attempted to craft with the legislation is something that would be clear that there are many employees of organizations that are not receiving compensation, aren't in a decision-making position, and aren't directly lobbying that we don't want to capture. 
we only want we want to try to narrow it to those that truly would self benefit from their participation in the legislation and that's you know maybe maybe not as clear in the language as you know we see it today, but that was what we were attempting to do mr chairman was to try to focus in on those individuals that are truly substantially trying to influence legislation that would then directly benefit themselves. Thank you. Further questions from seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank Senator. you, Mr. Chairman. Members. We'll see you in a few minutes. I we guess. Will. Yeah. Uh, chair would call um, Chairman Representative Bob Lynn, member of the Ethics Committee, supports the bill with reservations. He's right. So uh, good thank morning. you. Mr. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, as I indicate, as indicated on the note card, I, I do support the bill, but I do have some reservations. And um, one of the reservations I have, and I, I think it, it uh, goes to the question that was uh, asked by uh, of the previous witness. Um, I like I like the restrictions that the three uh, uh, restrictions that uh, uh, define when a legislator should recuse himself, that is, receives financial remuneration from an organization, holds a position to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of the organization, and the organization has lobbied, testified, or otherwise attempted to influence the outcome of the official legislative activity. But my question is, is sort of the, the, the opposite of, of the question that you raised. In other words, the, I guess the question that I have is, if you have those three conditions, which I think are good conditions, then why would you exclude from the definition of organization the United States of America, the state of New Hampshire, or a county? And I guess what I'm thinking is, is this. We, I know, and these are the because the advisory opinions are public records. We issued uh, two advisory opinions um, that I was involved in. One, one, and a third one that I was not involved in because I recused myself. But the two that that I was involved in, we dealt with uh, 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 Senator Innes and Senator Carson, and we said that their um, the fact that they were employed by the university system in one instance and the community college system in another did not require them to recuse themselves. Uh, but, but I guess the, the question I have is suppose that they, they were only working as, uh, I believe Senator Innes is a professor at the University of New Hampshire and uh, Senator uh, Carson, I believe is a part-time uh, instructor at the, uh, I, think the, I think Nashua Community College, but one of the community colleges anyway. But I, I guess the question that uh, it seemed to me it would have made a big difference is suppose that instead of working, instead of the position they held, they actually worked in the chancellor's office or something like that and were and had some, you know, involvement in the positions that the university was going to take on matters before the legislature. I think our outcome would have been, you know, that would have been an, a, a much different situation. And so, you know, I guess that I would say um, that's there, if you're going to have the, the requirements of being able to uh, in, uh, exercise substantial influence over an organization, then if you have that caveat, why wouldn't you include employees of the state or the federal government or or the counties? Um, so, I, you know, I, I would tend to say that they that they should be covered, um, and 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 you know to to give just to give an example, of, I think which I I think would would kind of go to the question you you raised, if if for example, you are a selectman in the town, and so you have you know you have a substantial authority over what what kind of what position the town would take, and you receive compensation from the town. And the town is going to lobby in favor of some particular particular measure before the legislature. I, I guess the question that I would ask is, 
why would why should the law say it's okay for you to do that? You're not, you know, you you don't have to recuse yourself. But suppose and let's take an I try to use a concrete example. Suppose, you know, the bill that was that we had quite a debate on, the question of like what um, whether um, people who make substantial requests for information under the right to know law, do they, should they have to pay for it? I, I, my, my recollection is that many municipalities were, thought that was a good idea, um, and, and there were a lot of other people who thought it was a bad idea. But suppose that uh, you, you know, a particular municipality, the selectmen in that municipality think it's a great, you know, we should be making people to pay, uh, making people pay for that, so that it doesn't, the burden doesn't fall on the taxpayer. Um, why should it be all right for a selectman who has taken that position and the uh, you know and receives comp well, let's assume they receive compensation for being a selectman uh, to be able to 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 vote on that? But suppose suppose that somebody from the ACLU who you know who was very much opposed to that legislation. Suppose we had somebody in a in a you know, in a relatively high level position with the ACLU, who was also a legislator. This would prohibit that ACLU member from from uh, voting. And it just seems like there's a there's some of the, something of a disconnect there. It, it seems to me either either both should be prohibited, should be prohibited or both should be allowed. But I, I have, you know, it's, I have some difficulty in understanding why why you would draw that distinction. Um, now, may, you know, maybe, and this is just a suggestion, maybe an answer to that would be to put some compensation dollar limits. In other words, I suspect that uh, most selectmen in the state of New Hampshire are not receiving high dollar compensation for their services. It would be, it would be very uh, surprising to me if they were. So maybe it would be, you know, maybe one solution might be to say, you know, um, a, a cutoff would be uh, a, 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 a state, federal, or municipal employee who is not earning more than some amount of money, you know, some relatively low amount of money. Um, and that would be, you know that would be a basis for the distinction. I, I'm just I'm just throwing that out as a possibility. I'm not saying that's necessarily the the right answer, but it's something to think about anyway. Thank you. Repres oh, good morning. Um, good, good morning, afternoon. Representative <laughs> Wall. Um, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony today and for being here. Oh, you. Um, you mentioned selectmen are not being paid much, but they are paid something, and selectmen and communities have tremendous power and influence as to what goes on. Wouldn't that be vitally important in terms of decisions that are made here? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I, I guess, you know, the, the, I, I appreciate the, the, uh, your colleague's concern about do we want to, you know, prohibit uh, people who are, are, so, are selectmen, for example, or school board members and also serve in the legislature. Do we want to kind of prohibit them from voting on things that about which they have a lot of information and a lot of knowledge? You know, that's uh, that that is the that really is the crucial question. Um, and I think the you know the other thing that I, that that would that concerns me, as I said before, is just the idea of balance. It I'm 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 not sure that it. It is a good idea to sort of generally exempt um, state employees or federal employees or county employees. Um, but and as you point out, if we're and that, that's another kind of uh, uh, you know distinction, and I'm not sure I understand why if you were going to uh, exempt federal employees, state employees, and county employees, then why not municipal employees? I mean, it just it doesn't quite. You know, that, that doesn't, there's a disconnect there, it seems to me. Um, so, anyway. Representative Wall. Follow up, Mr. Follow. Chairman. Thank you. And thank you for that explanation. So, I hear you saying it sort of depends on the hierarchy of where you are in your position or what influence you might have in the organization to which you belong. I, I think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I think I agree completely with Senator Susi. If somebody, you know, if somebody is, if, if I'm, 
you know, if I work for Amazon, but my position is I'm the, you know, I'm the chief custodian, then I think, and I'm also in the legislature, I don't think that um, it's very likely that my, um, you know, that I'm going to be influencing the positions of the organization. I mean, absent some, you know, unless there's some nefarious thing going on that they hired me specifically to be, you know, the, really my real job is to be a lobbyist for the for them, but I'm I'm acting as a, you know, as a chief custodian. That's probably pretty unlikely. Final question? Follow up. Thank you very much. So what I hear you saying is really up to the individual and the individual's position in terms of the issue that comes before the legislature to determine how much influence they might have on that petition, particular subject. And therefore, they would have to determine whether they should recuse or not. Is that correct? I, I th no, I think that's right. I think a lot of this, um, as I've just discussed on numerous occasions with the chairman, a lot of this does depend on, um, you know, legislators exercising sort of reasonable and good faith judgment of, you know, and I think we, I think we can't, we can't get away from that. That's that's a, a, a crucial part of this. Thank you very much. Representative Tierney. Thank you for taking my question, Representative. Okay, there is a bill this afternoon coming up. It's SB 553. It has to do with the PDIP accounts, and that is the public deposit investment pool. According to what's written here, I would not be allowed to say anything. I would not be, our treasurer would not be allowed to say anything, and yet we're the ones in the town who would have the most ex uh, knowledge of how those accounts work. All right. The only ones who could speak would be the opposing side, the ones who want the bill to pass. Would right. that be a fair way to run that hearing? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. I, I guess the only question I would have is, I don't, I don't know a lot about that bill, at least at this point, but the only question I would have is, is the, for example, has, has your town taken a position on, on this? You know what I'm saying? Is that, is that, or is that something that was just follow up? I, In answer to that, uh, basically, yes, the treasurer is okay. opposed okay. to it, our town administrator is opposed to it, and right. I'm the chair of the board of selectmen. Right. right. Uh, I'm opposed to it. It's not allowing us to make as much money as possible for the taxpayers. So it's making us violate our fiduciary right. responsibility to the right. town. Right. Right. No, I, I mean, I, I, I see what you're saying. And I think I agree with you. It's not, you know, you, you, you have to have some, you have to have some balance. And I don't, I don't know exactly where the, you know, where the line should be um, if, you know, the thing that would concern me is, for for example, if the, if, you know, suppose, I think maybe this is a really unlikely situation, but suppose that, you know, someone pretty high up in your uh, police department in the town, let's say, I should take the police department as an example, but um, was also in the legislature and there was a bill um, dealing with I don't know, increasing uh, pension benefits for for uh, for police officers. Um, the, you know, there I don't know if there and if and, and if the you know if the town uh, um, took a position that this was a great idea. Um, uh, I don't know, or, or that it, uh, you know, I don't know what the there. There it seems to me it's a closer uh, question about whether the person should be voting on that um, uh, on that. That's that's just an example. I, you indicated earlier that we do we have had numerous conversations about this, um, and I'm and I want to ask you specifically about line six on page two, which um, the heading is facts and circumstances. Um, it was our original intention in this committee to create some kind of guidelines so that individual employees would be able to make um, legitimate decisions for themselves and decide whether they were on um, the correct side of this recusal issue or not. 
it seems to me the more that we delve into this and the more we discuss individual cases and the more we review the actual um, ethics of, uh, opinions that have uh, come forth from the ethics committee, it seems that these facts and circumstances are becoming more and more important. It, and it almost did, would seem that each individual for uh, the 400 reps sitting in reps hall would need to have um, a review of their individual facts and circumstances before they could be confident of of their actions. And so I'm, I guess my question for you is, does this legislation coming forth from the Senate, coupled with your knowledge of what the House passed on consent calendar a couple weeks ago, does this move that ball forward? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's subject to the concerns that I've raised about the, the election. <laughs> yes. I, I guess my sense is I think it does. I think it is. I think that generally the idea of the substantial, uh, have a substantial influence over the organization, um, you know, the definition of when the fees is required, I think that that does um, move the ball forward. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for testifying. Thank you. Uh, chair would call um, the chairman of um, the Ethics Committee, um, the Honorable Ned Gordon. Welcome to Legislative Administration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ned Gordon. I do chair the Ethics Committee. I'm from Bristol, a former legislator. I, um, I support the bill. I think it uh, clarifies the standard for recusal. I think there are circumstances where it is obvious to most people, including the public, that recusal is appropriate. And we should have, at least in our statutory guidelines, a standard for that. And currently, we don't. If you were to read the guidelines, there is nothing that mentions recusal at all. But again, there are circumstances where it appears, has appeared obvious to the Ethics Committee, and I think to many, that recusal is an, is an appropriate outcome. And I think, ultimately, it was contemplated in our Constitution in the 1700s that a recusal, uh, that there are circumstances where it's not appropriate for a legislator to act. Uh, and uh, to act as a legislator on certain matters when they have a personal involvement. So uh, I think this, uh, the standards that are set forth in this legislation pretty much mirror the advisory opinions that we have been issuing, particularly with regard to people receiving financial remuneration and whether or not that organization has actively participated in uh, influencing the outcome of legislation. And in our, in our more recent opinions, particularly the last opinions that we've had, you'll see that I think we've also incorporated what is included here as sort of the third prong of the test, and that is whether or not the person who is employed in the organization has substantial influence over the organization. So I think it sets forth a standard. I think it's consistent with what we've been doing. And I think uh, having it in statute makes a lot of sense. I do have a comment with regard to uh, the, the I, I fully agree with the portion of the bill that says that these uh, three criteria are deemed to be having substantial influence, voting members of the governing body, presidents, executive officers, treasurers. But I think my, my only concern is a sort of a statutory thing, and this comes from being a lawyer, I think, and a judge, and that is if I were reading through the statutes and I read that first, I might get the impression that, that, that those are the only things that have substantial influence. And then you go to the next section, and it talks about the facts and circumstances which constitute substantial influence. I might just reverse those and put the facts and circumstances of substantial influence first, and then put persons having 
persons having these particular roles are deemed to have substantial influence after that. So there wouldn't be any confusion with that, that regard. With regard to uh, uh, Representative Lynn's concerns, um, I guess I share some of those concerns because I believe that there would be circumstances where people do um, uh, are involved in governmental matters where I think if you were looking at it as a member of the public, you would say it would not be appropriate for them to vote on things. So if the financial officer of the university system was a legislator, and was involved in developing the budget for the university system and promoting it here, I don't think they should be voting on it. So, um, but if I was a selectman and I'm just one of 250 towns in the state that feels a particular way, I really don't think that that would disqualify you from having an opinion as to whether a lot legislation should be passed or not passed. But, that's my, I, I have to say, uh, first of all, that uh, we, we talked about whether or not this is uh, informative for legislators or whether it's intended to be punitive. I can tell you that the Ethics Committee doesn't view itself as punitive in the least. Um, it rules on complaints and when it's appropriate, will act on complaints. But over the 30 years the Ethics Committee's been here, there have only been less than a handful of times when we've actually recommended punishment for legislators. What we've done our very best to do is to inform legislators to uh, make sure that uh, things are done appropriately. But once in a while, you get a circumstance where you see it's just appropriate for somebody to recuse themselves. I mean, and we see it, the public sees it. Uh, they, if we had, and you know, these are all you know, public opinions, the Doug Lay opinion, for example, you know, it's pretty clear, you know, a circumstance you can't be, in, in essence, lobbying and voting on the same, same things. Um, and uh, more recent opinions that have come out it's pretty obvious. So it's it's pretty obvious to somebody. So what, but we're not going out there looking as a police force for people to punish for their bad behavior. What we're trying to do is our very best is to educate and make sure that uh, when the public looks at our legislature, they see people who are ethical and who are uh, doing their very best to be honest and to serve the state well. I think it was me that brought up the word uh, punishment, and I think I, it would have been better to say perhaps that it was a tool of adjudication. It's a, yep. it's uh, whether it's for in, informational purposes for the legislator or whether it helps the ethics committee to determine um, whether there's a violation or not. I think that's better. Um, do you have a minute or two for questions, if there are any? Yep, I'll do my best. Representative Wall, who's also on the ethics committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for being here. Um, you mentioned selectmen and positions they may or may not take because uh, we're one of over 200 towns in the, or municipalities in the state. This may go back to when you were on judiciary. We had um, a lot of landlords who were on the judiciary committee and were taking or making votes. Um, on certain issues that were the landlord-tenant things, thinking it directly affected them. Would that be a more sensitive situation than selectmen being parts of all the communities in the state? I mean, there are landlords all over the state. So how would this work with landlords? I, I think it's a similar circumstance that there are landlords ultimately who will be affected by legislation, just like municipalities will be affected by legislation but they're not being paid to be there to lobby and influence the legislation itself. And so I don't think that there's a necessity for them to recuse themselves. Further questions? Um, I have 
uh, one or two. Um, as far as the municipality, we seem to have centered in on selectmen, but there are plenty of other um, influencers within the within a municipality. Um, you know, by fire chiefs, police chiefs. Um, would would that would those same circumstances that same discussion occur? Um, we see oftentimes a, a uniform. Um, come through and testify on on things. Um, we have plenty of officers that are um, legislators. I, is it all going to fall down onto this facts and circumstances situation? Do you think? Yeah, I do. Um, well, I don't think you you can make a decision just based upon. A generalization, you know, that's why you need the standard to apply to this particular case. But just because you are a firefighter or a police officer and you take a position in and of itself, I don't think that's going to disqualify you. What disqualifies you is if you're getting paid to do it, basically. So, just to clarify, if you're getting paid to testify, you're saying, rather than the outcome of the legislation that you're testifying on pays you. Right. I mean, if you're a firefighter and you feel strongly about something and you come here, I don't think anybody is going to find that you should be disqualified or re that you need to recuse. But if you are paid to do so, then certainly you would be required to recuse. Um, so a quick just clarification on that. So if, um, if for example, we have a, a piece of legislation dealing with, um, with the retirement system, and it would be clear that the firefighters um, or any of group two or group one benefit from that legislation, where where are they in that in that scenario? Um, where would would a, a legislator who is also a firefighter and or a policeman and or um, uh, county just being just being part of an organization wouldn't disqualify you, but I think you'd have to apply the standard as to whether or not you were um, had substantial influence over the effort to affect the legislation. I see. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'm sure this won't be the last conversation we have on the topic. We've had many conversations. We have. Thank you very much. Um, I have only one additional pink card, um, and that comes from Eric Payer. Um, Power, I'm sorry, uh, who supports the bill and is asking for two minutes from the School District Governance Association. Welcome to Legislative Administration. Thank you, committee members, honorable chair. My name is Eric Power. I come from the town of Brookline. I'm also the president of the School District Governance Association of New Hampshire, which is an all-volunteer volunteer organization uh, statewide. I just want to bring up a couple of points to consider um, with this um, legislation. So I also previously schooled, uh, served on the school board, Hollis Brookline Cooperative School Board for three years, and I got paid $450 a year. But I was on the governing body of a school board. So keep that in mind when you're looking at renumeration. Um, I think that select boards, um, I also serve on the planning board in Brookline. Uh, I don't get paid for that right now, but who knows, that could change in the future. But I think if people are serving in these in a school board and municipality um, and getting some sort of stipend, and selectmen tend to get more than school board for whatever reason, but some upper limit, maybe $5,000, $10,000, that if you're getting financial remuneration, you're not going to get rich from legislation. The, the select board members aren't going to get rich. School board members aren't going to get rich. So can, can kind of consider that, that just saying you get a dollar would, would, would fill that square. So, or 
my wife's a state rep, as you, as some folks might know, she would be disqualified from it because I got a dollar. So we don't want to do that. So we will probably want to put some um, upper limit because if some sort of legislation passes um, and you were involved, you don't want to have to come back to it. And you're not going to get rich by um, being a select board member or a school board member if some sort of legislation passes. So I would say that. Um, also, in uh, you know, line six talks that we talked about, you talked about potentially adding in uh, municipalities, but I would also, maybe you would want to use a term like political subdivision, because that would cover school districts, that would cover village districts, that would cover municipalities, that would cover cities, it would cover more in that uh, aspect, I think, and that would be important. Um, I do think it's really important that, you know, you have the three conditions that have to be met. And I think it needs to be clear. Maybe it's clear enough in there because I wouldn't want my wife to be um, having to recuse herself. She's in the same household as me if I, if those don't all meet. So the number one wouldn't be met because I don't get paid by my organization. Um, but we want to make sure that you keep that because I think it's important for all three. And I think the main thing you're trying to look at here is, is the individual going to enrich themselves or is their spouse or family member going to enrich themselves are they going to get some financial direct financial benefit? Uh, and I agree, this is a very challenging area. There's a lot of circumstances you got to look at. But if you're putting sort of these top level uh, guidelines out there, I think we, you know, I have a lot of people in SDGA that are school board members and budget committee members. Some are paid, most of them are paid some sort of stipend. Um, we wouldn't want them to have be caught by this uh, legislation. So having some upper limit, I think, makes a lot of sense. And um, otherwise, I. Now, I support the bill. I think it's a good thing to give some guidance to our legislators to know when to recuse themselves. So thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, further questions? I have one. Um, in, in a lot of these conversations we've had, um, it talks about uh, real or perceived conflict. Um, you are the only member so far to have spoken uh, from the public. Um, is is there a perception um, that there are there are um, items that uh, legislators need to be aware of from the purposes of conflicts for the for the sake of conflicts? I think as you know, as a member of the public and looking at this, I think you want to see how direct is that benefit. You know, I think a firefighter coming in to speak about group two, or group one teacher coming in. Um, I think that that's a, it's such a big population that they, they're, they're entitled to. And as some of the other members have said in the committee, a lot of the folks that are speaking have subject matter expertise more than others. So if you really want to, as legislators, make an informed decision, I think you need to be able to take that in. And is that influence or not? It's sort of like state employees. Are they allowed to take positions on bills while they're on duty or not? But they are subject matter experts. So I think you have to balance that. But I think you have to look at the circumstance that are you, if you're, if you're the treasurer of the university system and you're then on the finance committee, the finance division two or three, whichever one does that, obviously that from a member of the public, I would say, why is, why are they on there setting their budget to get some more money? But if it's a, if it's, it depends how direct the benefit is and how big the group is, I think is the bit from a member of the public. That's what would upset people more than anything. Um, but we don't want to set legislation here that would catch people getting stipends from being able to help form uh, legislation here up here, whether they're and, and or their their spouse, you know, they might not even be the person. Keep that in mind. You have a family member that lives with you. So you want to keep that in mind. But I think that's the main thing the public would be like to see is that people aren't enriching themselves by passing legislation. I think that's kind of the bottom line here. People get might get more power. Is that. Is that something people worry about? I don't think people worry about that as much as somebody getting enriched. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Seeing none, thank you very thank much. Thank you. I have no other pink cards. If there's anyone else in the audience that would like to comment, I'm perfectly happy to take a pink card. Seeing none, I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 605. Thank you.
the time being 10 minutes of 11, um, we will open up Senate Bill 331, recognize, well, are you, uh, uh, Senator Waters, are you the prime sponsor of this? I, I am. I'm ready. And I uh, recognize Senator David Waters, um, prime sponsor for Senate Bill 331. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good to see you all. I'm Senator David Waters from District 4 to introduce Senate Bill 331 uh, relative to certain historic commemorations. As you will see, the uh, bill has two parts. Um, one is, as is customary, as I've explained, uh, to direct that the Joint Legislative Historical Committee accept a uh, portrait of uh, former Senator Martha Fuller Clark. And the second part of the bill um, again, by procedures we've done before, um, ask that bottle, uh, liquor bottle revenue from the commemorative bottles be directed towards the American Revolution Sester Centennial, and I'm going to call it 250th Commission, if you don't mind, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I will speak about that as, as well. Um, so as to the uh, uh, first part, um, I will say we have other member of the Joint Legislative Historical Committee here. Um, we've made an effort over many years to curate portraits to represent people who have made contributions to the state. You see the results uh, all around the, uh, the halls and um, has brought forward a proposal to include a portrait of the former Senator Martha Fuller Clark. Um, and such a portrait was already commissioned. We have it. And uh, so we'd like to have this legislation to direct the historical committee to accept the gift and to find a place for it on our state house walls. Uh, let me note as well that the committee has made major efforts over the last several years to kind of rationalize and organize the portrait collection throughout the halls of the uh, of the state house um, and to move some things around and to deal with the governor's <laughs> portraits coming flowing out of the governor's office as as the time is and and then accepting other other ones and doing some rearranging bringing things down to the first four that ought to be on the uh, first four, um, making clearer the designation of the Civil War area, the, the uh, American Revolutionary and War of 1812 area, and so on and so forth. And in that process, it means that we have been able to um, uh, ensure that there is space available for subsequent portraits in the, uh, in the future. Um, we will hear, uh, I think, from others about the extraordinary record of Senator Fuller Clark, and I, I just would like to add to that, um, having worked with her for many years, that, you know, it's hard to drive around the state without seeing things that have the, the uh, touch of Senator Fuller Clark, whether it's the environment, L-CHIP, the planetarium, um, and just countless, countless bills uh, as a House member and as a, and a Senate member. And I think as the sponsorship of this bill reflects, um, she was an extraordinarily bipartisan legislator, whether she was in the House or the Senate. And I think that was long recognized about her, and that's why the sponsorship you will see uh, reflects that as well. So just to summarize on that, um, this is the usual formula that we do. Um, the state does not ever, does not pay for portraits, whether it's the governor or not. Uh, privately raised funds create the, the portrait, and then um, we need to have a bill that uh, instructs the uh, Joint Legislative Historical Committee to accept the, the portrait and find a place for it. Now, the second um, part of the bill, I, I just, you know, I'm very excited about it. It's great fun because we've got a 250th anniversary coming up of the, uh, of the American Declaration of Independence. And, um, you know, these anniversaries keep coming up, don't they? We did the, the bicentennial of the State House. We had the Civil War. Um, and, you know, this is just an opportunity for us to celebrate New Hampshire history. Um, and uh, about 20, no, no, I'm sorry, about 12 years ago, we recommenced the historic liquor bottle program, which had kind of been suspended for many years, and uh, reestablished that to about once a year have the Liquor Commission design uh, a bottle. And the funds that are raised from that have been going uh, first, uh, they were directed entirely to the Hall of Flags and the preservation of the Hall of Flags and that great history that's represented there and we've done a lot of work uh, you know new film on the glass uh, new the new uh the new stained glass over the the front door and um any kind of preservation and conservation that needs to be there and then we expanded um that that funds use so that it can include other historical 
uses as, as well. Um, what we have done uh, since the reestablishment of this is to direct the um, funds from a liquor bottle that is issued in relationship to a particular historic event to that event's coffers. We did that with the um, bicentennial of the State House. So we had the bottles, the couple of bottles there that the revenue, um, and it can run from like 50 to 80,000 potentially, depending on the bottle, depending on the marketing. Um, and so now with the 250th anniversary, uh, with the establishment of the Sesquicentennial Commission, which again, some of us are, are on, uh, the commission uh, affirmed the idea that if we could do that for them because they had no funding uh, from the state when the commission was established and needed to raise their funds, that this would be a way to do that. So the bill established a fund form and then directs the uh, revenue from the bottles that are created uh, to commemorate the uh, Declaration of Independence, um, that, that those funds will come in. We'll be able to use them um, for the celebrations that were directed to do. One is about um, the uh, Fort Constitution, and gonna, big plans coming up for Fort Constitution. Uh, and so this commission is supposed to work on that, and we're also supposed to plan appropriate historical events at the at the State House and maybe elsewhere, mostly at the State House, as we did with the bicentennial of the the State House um, for July Fourth. Uh, you know those days around July Fourth of of twenty uh, twenty six, and um, so that the, that's the two parts, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Senator. Um, are there further questions? Representative Wall. Thank you. You didn't bring the portrait. No. I've got a little picture of it if you'd like to see. It, it, it's, it's a beauty. In the office. Now. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is um, the historic, and I, for disclosure, I'm vice chair of that committee. I'm yeah. also on the Sister Centennial Committee, so bear with me. Um, so I know where you it's have going. To yourself, thank I you. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> um, regarding the portrait, so that the historical committee can accept it and then decide what to do with it, where to yeah. hang it, is that your intent? Yeah, it's, thank you for the question. That's what we always do. Great, thank yeah. you. Along that line, um, I wanted to make sure or that you would be all right with the, the line in that, in the bill itself, speaks to the State House. Um, it's my understanding they may decide that it's more appropriate in the LOB rather than the state house. So um, that would be left up to them, correct? I think so. Um, you know, and thank you for your question because some of the things we've done in the last few years, you may notice that we've um, accepted some portraits uh, that were at the, over at the Supreme Court. Right. And we now have them in um, room 100. And uh, we have put um, some portraits over into the legislative office building. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think an argument might be made, and we'll discuss this on the committee, that given um, her stature and the need in some ways to recognize, um, you know, we have Donna Sci Tech hanging up there, and, and I think it's a, a good thing for us to be able to have the public come in and, and, and see the women who have contributed. And we have Dudley Dudley. So wherever wherever is a good space for it, right. Mr. Chairman. Great. Yeah. Thank you. The flexibility is there. Where are the comments? Seeing none, thank you, thank very, you very much, much. Senator. And I, I do have a little Xerox, does anybody want to look at it? <laughs> Chair, can, we call. Uh, I can just hold it up. There's the Xerox. Ah, there okay. you go. It's thank not too you. big. Okay. <laughs> nice portrait. It's bigger than that, though. Yeah. Uh, Senator Susan. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, once again, I'm Donna Susi, representing Senate District 18. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things since my, my colleague really spoke very well to the magnitude of the legislation. Um, I want to speak specifically to the portion about the portrait of Senator Fuller Clark, which if you are interested in seeing the actual portrait is in my office in State House 120, you are welcome to come see it. Um, she was first elected in 1990 to the House and served on the Municipal and County Government Committee. I know this because we were first elected together and served on that committee together. Um, but Senator Fuller Clark's leadership in both the House and the Senate um, was truly distinguished. She ultimately served in the position of Senator Pro Tem, uh, the assistant to the Senate President. But her body of work 
just in the legislature alone is really quite extraordinary. Um, she had 113 bills on which she was the prime sponsor that were signed into law, 623 bills that were signed into law that she co-sponsored. Um, but apart from the, the breadth of legislation alone, I think Senator Fuller Clark probably will, when history books are written, be known as a distinguished citizen uh, because of the philanthropy of both her and her husband and because of the extraordinary impact she's had on the lives of people throughout the state of New Hampshire um, through various positions. Um, one of the things that my colleague didn't mention, but that I think is really important for the record, um, the artist who painted the portrait is Ralph Stoney Jacobs. Um, Stoney Jacobs is a resident of Whitefield, New Hampshire, and he has uh, done numerous portraits. Um, Senator Shaheen and Senator, uh, excuse me, excuse me, Senator Shaheen and Governor Lynch's portraits were done by Stoney Jacobs. There are portraits that hang throughout the United States. Um, he is a, a really renowned artist, but as I said, is a you know a resident of Whitefield, New Hampshire. So not only is the portrait of a local citizen, but it was also uh, painted by a local artist. Um, and I would just, in closing, say. Right now, of the 213 portraits that hang in the State House and the complex, nine of them are women. Um, so I think it would be great to increase that percentage by accepting this additional portrait. So with that, I close my testimony and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Senator. Uh, are there further questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing Mr. none, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, tolerating this. Uh, we now call Jennifer Goodman. And Jennifer is in support of the bill. She represents New Hampshire Preservation for Alliance. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much, um, members of the committee, for uh, hearing me today. I'm Jennifer Goodman, the executive director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, the statewide historic preservation nonprofit. And I'll, I'll just add a very short portrait to the point about the portrait. We certainly uh, support this bill. Um, I think as Senator Waters alluded to, if you look around um, the state, you see so many ways that the preservation, that um, former Senator Martha Fuller Clark has uh, shaped and enhanced um, our state and our communities. Um, and my, um, I think I'm just representing one of many different sectors and many different parts of, of the state and uh, the disciplines where she made a difference. Um, if you look around and are enjoying rural landscapes, old farms and barns, vibrant villages or downtowns, restored and reused community landmarks, you see the work of Martha Fuller Clark. As a state senator and a state representative, she was an early and effective leader in helping fellow legislators understand historic preservation strategies and their benefits and acting to improve policies and sort of the toolkit around historic preservation. The list of her legislative achievements is varied and far reaching, and she forged really important relationships and connections to agriculture, economic development, housing and conservation over her legislative career to get that work done. So we feel that this portrait will honor her great work and her legacy and remind future generations to advocate for that special character and, and economic benefits associated with things like historic preservation, things that make New Hampshire so special for its residents and its visitors. So thank you and um, happy to answer any questions. And we sounds like you'll support this bill and you have our um, great support for it as well. Thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony. You say you have 20 copies? I do. Uh, could you hand those out, please? 
And thank you for all the information you added. Um, I just wish we saw, I've seen it, but I wish the other members could currently see the portrait. Thank you very much for being here. It, uh, Yes, DNCR stands for the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources within the state. Um, <clears throat> thank you, committee members, for accepting this testimony um, on behalf of DNCR um, regarding Senate Bill 331A um, to certain historic commemorations. I'd like to speak to the commemorative bottle portion of the bill. Um, my name is Matt Flanders. I'm the director of the Bureau of Historic Sites for the state of New Hampshire. Um, we oversee Fort Constitution in Newcastle, New Hampshire. Um, I also serve as the chair of the uh, Susser Centennial Commission currently. Um, the commission was established in 2022 under HB 1441. It's charged with organizing, arranging, and coordinating tributes to the American Revolution, culminating with a publicized event on July 4th, 2026. Um, relating to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, in 2023, Senate Bill 103 added to the Commission's planning activities the raid on Fort William and Mary, which is now Fort Constitution, um, through a publicized event this December 14th, 2024. Um, the bill will enable the Commission to collaborate with the Liquor Commission to manufacture commemor commemorative bottles to celebrate the 250th anniversary. Um, uh, of the revolution under the Liquor Commission's Historical Fund Program in RSA 177-8. Um, the proceeds from the sale of the commemorative bottles will be deposited in the uh, Sester Centennial Trust Fund to help support the work of the commission. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me to provide this testimony and I'm open to any questions if you have any. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Yes. Thank you for taking my question and thank you for being here today. I'm uh, just curious, what what are the new bottles going to look like? I don't know that. Do I think the Liquor theme? Commission might design those, and I only heard that just during Senator Waters' testimony, but I, I don't know that we're taking an active role in the design. We're happy to if um, if invited to, but um, we haven't gotten there yet. I think I think this bill will start that process, potentially. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions or concerns from the committee? Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the information you added today. Thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone else who wants to testify today? There being none, we're closing the hearing. Thank you very much, and we are done. Thank you. Hey, Rich, do you need to see me? Yeah, well, if you want to hang around a few minutes to see if he comes back, because um, he said he would be back. The work schedule was listed in the calendar, but we don't see it. He's not seeing yeah, it. Yeah, but I just don't want to make that uh, announcement yeah. for him. Yeah, I would hate for him to come back and have an empty room. <laughs> yeah, take a break, everybody. And um, if Microphone with me. I was just saying, just before we leave, I would like to gauge a little bit of everyone's sentiment on the, the first bill we heard in relation to, we, we did a lot of work on the, uh, the previous ethics bill. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like, are we going to, do we take this one and we have to leave that one? Are we, do we, do we like both of these? Like, I, I don't, just where are you guys at with, with it in terms of. Did we hold on to that bill? I can't remember if we No, put we it... passed it on consent. Okay. So, yeah, so the right. Senate has it. Right okay. Now. We passed it, um, what was it, 15 to 0? I think we have one. Yeah, I couldn't remember if we had passed it or not. I don't know what we did. Yeah. And so this lays out some specific criteria, which I think is really good. That, that yeah, exactly. Is it, we'd have to look and see if it's it would the be same a kind, of, kind of like a combination. So we could pass both. 
It's and it would going to the floor of the house, right? Yeah, well, no, it's it's already to the center. It's already to the center, yeah. yeah. So I don't know what their plans are with it. Maybe we could work it together in the committee of conference. Mm -hmm. or Yeah. Okay. It all falls on each other. Does it just go up to the end or when it comes to the fourth? Oh, oh, he was talking about the ethics bill. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, yeah. yeah, the first bill. The, yeah. 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 You Does know. Rich know the answer to that? Oh, can you can you talk with Rich and see if he might know the answer? Yeah, he's really smart and he knows a lot. <laughs> Did you hear any of our conversation? You can certainly sit at the microphone. At least we can yeah. all hear each other. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot, but you're up on this stuff. The House bill is um, for the Senate. It's um, been assigned to the Executive Department's Administration Committee. Okay. Yeah, and is, there's no hearing set yet. Yeah, but in terms of how these two. Uh, Imagining we pass both of these, would these two marry up pretty well, or, or are we going to have to choose one or, over the other? You know what I mean? Uh, this is very, this is much more specific and much more narrow, whereas the, that our House bill was uh, a little more broad. You know, it's how would these two mesh is really what my question is. And, and do we have to do anything with this bill to mesh them together? That will... All sorts of things can happen like that, including committees of conference. Uh, right. So um, that's a policy decision. I don't think I should comment on it. It could happen. What What is really good about this bill is that you know there are many moving parts with our ethics provisions. There are two statutes. There are the guidelines, and there's 32 years of precedent in decisions and opinions. And so, if you make a lot of changes. There can be unintended consequences. In fact, there will be. And this does not, doesn't do anything to affect other parts of our provisions. So the, the whole disclosure system stays in place. And you know, we've been educating legislators on how that works for all this time. And so all this would do is add another level, very narrowly defined, for recusal. And so, for example, on these examples of firefighters or retirement system members and so forth, you, disclosure would still come into place in all those circumstances where you, it wouldn't rise to the level of required recusal. You'd start with disclosure. You would. So if you're in the retirement system and you've made that disclosure on the January form, as we call it, at the beginning of the biennium, you wouldn't have to do anything more in terms of disclosure unless it affects you more than others. Then if you get to a level where you're involved, as I understand this, with being with the part of the retirement system that might do lobbying, then that's when this would come into place. And on the landlord-tenant situation, if you were part of the lobbying organization that the real estate association, or whatever they call it, um, then that would fall into the place here in terms of recusal. Otherwise, if you're a landlord, you would file that disclosure in, in the January filing, the financial disclosure form. So it leaves all of that in, the, in place. And, and I, I could envision adding one part of the declaration of intent form to have a box for I'm, I'm required to recuse. That way it doesn't create any more paperwork either. And you need something like that on the House or Senate floor if you're not going to, as you know, if you're not, not going to vote. <laughs> That's amazing testimony. You should t type that up and, and send it in as an opinion. And before you so go on, I'm sorry. Go, before you go on, though, back on the landlord tenant thing, disclosure. Um, disclosure is enough. Um, over the years, we've heard that, and we did have this on judiciary, we had a lot of landlords, it seemed they were not disclosing that they were landlords, but through the great time we heard. What would be the process, so members know, for disclosure? It stays in place now, which is that if you're participating in verbal advocacy, you're required currently to say before a committee or on the floor, um, I am a landlord. There's no greater, you don't, you don't have to go on and on about it, I am a landlord. That's the verbal disclosure. And so the other disclosure should already have occurred on the financial disclosure form. And if a bill is going to affect you more than other landlords, then you will have to file the declaration of intent form. In terms of recusal, 
you would probably have to be a member of the New Hampshire Realtor Association, which does lobbying. You have to be paid by them. <coughs> so there'd be no change in terms of that. Okay, and going to the representative attorney's concern about selectmen, my former concern as a former selectman, um, if we had an issue, and this is just hypothetical, years ago, selectmen and communities were able to find out, and they still do, ahead of time, who hasn't paid their taxes on their property. And after three years, um, that can, what is the term? I've lost it now. Put a lien on it, yeah. yeah. And some selectmen in some towns were buying those properties only for taxes, becoming landlords or turning around and selling them. And actually, we heard today, um, the term was used, um, bear with me, the term was used, people enriching themselves. And selectmen in some towns were enriching themselves. We now have a law that prevents them from doing that. Um, I'm thinking if there are other bills that might come before the House, such as, oh, I don't know, placing a landfill somewhere in a town, and a landlord, uh, excuse me, a selectman, I'm sorry, a selectman wants it as far away from his property as he or she could get it. Mm -hmm. Uh, would have some influence on that. Shouldn't they then consider recusing? If this person is a legislator you're speaking about also. Yeah. Uh, well, currently, uh, there would be a disclosure issue. Uh, under this, uh, I mean, it's the three-part requirement. And so they would have to also be uh, involved with um, their organization lobbying, testifying, or otherwise attempting to influence the uh, legislative activity. See, this is, this is where my question comes in, because I think in our other bill, it puts it much closer to they would have to recuse, whereas this one would be clear, you wouldn't, you would, it's all of the above, you have to do one. It's very narrow. It's very narrow in scope, and, and where our other bill, I think, is a much more uh, broad and potentially would have to recuse. So that's why I'm wondering how we're going to figure out the two bills. Can I ask a question before we go on? Jen, um, this is all really good discussion. I don't know if it's being recorded or not. Have you stopped no. the recording? Because we've, we've moved into a work session. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I, I was just texting you, but um, they, it, it just goes away. Oh, good, because I yeah. was wondering. I'm not taking notes, but it's all really good information, so I just... I can go back later and type it up and put yeah. it in the notes if yeah. you want. Okay. okay. So we'll just say work session continued. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. I, I, thank you. Go ahead. Question. Okay. It says on line nine, receives uh, financial remuneration from the organization. I get paid by the town $100 a meeting for 2400 bucks a year. That's it holds a position to exercise substantial influence over the affairs. I'm chairman of the board of selectmen. Now, the organization has lobbied, testified, or otherwise attempted to influence the outcome of the official legislative activity. The town of Northumberland belongs to the New Hampshire Municipal Association, which uh, does lobby. Did I just fit all three of those criteria? Maybe. I think... Um it was um, Representative Lynn who suggested a, putting a dollar amount in there, perhaps, too. Okay. Because the way it's written now, <coughs> since we belong to NHMA, mm -hmm. I believe I fill all three right, of those up, not to mention when you go down further, I'm obviously a voting member of the governing body. But are you a, an employee of the New Hampshire Municipal Association? No. Nope. I, I think that is probably... We're a, mem we're a member. But you personally? No, not personally. The town is. Because it says a legislator um, receives financial remuneration from the organization. I think in that case, they're referring, your example, you'd be referring to the municipal association as the organization which is doing the lobbying. Okay. And I think that falls within the hierarchy that uh, Representative Bob Lynn was talking about in terms of being an adjunct professor. So 
uh, post being a chancellor for a university system. Um, being a selectman, we, you, are um, at, sorry, a lower level of that hierarchy and you're only a member of the municipal association. Again, you're not paid by the municipal association, you're paid by your town. Right, that makes sense. So you're guess, safe. If you look at it one way, it fills every single one of those. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. We re might want to look at the wording of that um, just for a little further clarification. I think that makes sense. That is the wording. So yeah, I, no, to so look at this and, and go for further clarification okay. in, in terms of how we want this drafted. Yes, Rich, did you have something to add to that? Because you would have to be an employee, the way I see this, of the entity which is doing the lobbying. Yeah. Yeah, but Lauren's sixty. It's almost like his own section. Yeah. Voting members of the board. Yeah. That's part of it. And so that's what I would do. Because and you guys are members of the section. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are members of the section. Yeah. 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 Yeah
my my question is, can these work together? Because they, they're a right. little. This is much more narrow in scope. It's very specific and all that. And does this committee has um, and I would say on consent sort of situation do we like one bill over the other and we shouldn't wait that long because if we don't like this and we like our bill well maybe we should kill it hurry up and kill this thing and, and then you leave it with the only the senate to have our bill i know that's a little bit of politics but that that's the the body that we are in and if it's not though if we can get both of these sort of passed and then maybe it's a committee a conference thing where we can figure out how we get it then then the pressure is off and we can work on it and that sort of thing so absolutely true i don't disagree with any of that thank you and um talking with representative tiernan I, I, we may need further clarification because he tell me if i'm wrong we talked about um those three criteria and each one of them matches what he does as a slot and I'm not in law, so it doesn't matter to me. But um, talked about a person having substantial influence as a selectman, and we talked a little bit about that. Wondered if there might need to be some clarification on the language, just to be sure um, that selectmen are not affected. And we did get clarification: the fact that the selectmen do pay into the New Hampshire Municipal Association, but do not have a direct influence necessarily on what they decide. Um, and it seems to fit in with the criteria that, um, I hope this is not being recorded. Um, it seems yeah, to fit in. <laughs> okay. Seems you want to talk about it later? <laughs> <laughs> um, fits in with the criteria that um, the hierarchy that Representative Lynn talked about in terms of a professor, an adjunct to professor, not having the same position and power of authority as a chancellor for a university system. A selectman has a power of authority at certain levels, but uh, with the Municipal Association, uh, only a membership of one of over 200 communities or municipalities, rather, in the state. So there's that difference, but the, we may need uh, further clarification on language, just so that others who aren't familiar with this uh, would understand it better. Uh, let me ask if if this is a help to any of you, because I'm I'm able to provide all of it if you would like. Um, I I um, bothered a number of people to provide me with pieces of information. One of which was the testimony that took place in the Senate on this bill. Um, there was some language there that is kind of helpful, I think. There was also the, the information that came from the draft minutes of the Ethics Committee who talked about, um, let me just back up a second. You realize this bill, and I think she said it, this bill um, as, came as a result of the opinion given to Senator Carson's request for an opinion, right? So that discussion of how they determined, how the Ethics Committee came up with their reasoning steered this, uh, this duo of, of Susie and Bradley to come up with this bill, or they asked uh, their Senate attorney to do that. So. So there is some interesting conversation that went on. They're not even sure, and, and this is, here's the guy that took the notes in that committee, but, but my understanding of those minutes were they really weren't sure which section applied, but they both agreed why they were um, not to recuse. They weren't sure. Under, they disagreed on which section applied to the to the situation, but but that's that's a microcosm of how confusing this is. If they can't decide w how this works, how the heck is the guy in Division Three in the middle of the row going to decide? That's my problem all along in all of this. And I also think um, here is the analysis. This is this was confusing to me. This is the computer, uh, the committee analysis on that bill, and it and there was a line that said they clearly are unable to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of those organizations. 
their senators. Um, and, and they are instructors within the university system. So are we now, it seems like we're dancing on the head of a pin. Um, are we now worried about how big an organization is? Are we now worried about what their position within that organization is? Are we now worried about their ability to influence actions if that organization comes here? It is, and, and, and where is the line drawn if you're not worried about it? I mean, everyone likes to bring up the idea of the janitor versus the CEO, but there's a lot of positions in between there, and, and I don't think anyone, and I don't know that this legislation, I'll have to look at it more closely, but I don't know if anyone has told me where that, where that line falls, and that this is a problem, this isn't. And that's hard. Yes. You have some very strong points. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have always. questions. I don't have points. I have, yeah. Concerns. Concerns. Um, yeah, and that's where I am at this point, too, because as I listened to testimony today, I heard that it's really up to the individual to determine, which is, throws us right back to where we have been. Right. We're not moving forward. We're not getting, as you said, that what clear line of definition. The walk up. We yeah. don't know. Yep. I. It seems the more we delve into this, the deeper the questions. Yeah. And it does seem to come down to that line in the of um, circumstances um, for each individual case. Yeah. Well, how does that help a legislator who's trying to, before they even become a legislator, if they're trying to decide whether to run and they are handed this booklet and say, here's all you need to know about whether you're going to be able to vote on the things that are important to you. I don't think they are going to have that ability to do that from that book. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what I'm seeing. So right now, everything we're talking about, if we're looking this way. I don't really need monkey, monkey wrenches, right? Really, yeah, yeah. Well, this way, we're not looking at yet. That way, is the perception of the public. We are wondering about, strictly on everything we're talking about, is the perception we have for fellow members. We should actually be looking more as to how do they perceive the stuff, and if they're not as bothered by it, mm. why the heck are we oh. that terribly bothered by it? I mean... No, I, I disagree. I, I think it is important, very important, to understand their level uh, or their perspective, but my personal ethics don't change based on whether somebody else thinks it's a problem. Neither do mine, and mine don't change even by what's written in this. That is somebody's, that is somebody's or some organization's opinion, and strictly that an opinion. Uh, you signed on to that. I signed on to it. Doesn't mean I believe 100% in it. Uh, there are things. Right, but getting back to your idea of whether it matters, it does matter what the public perceives. Right. But it, but that doesn't change whether, it, even if they are not, I still think this is an important issue for us to Right, but what I'm saying, what I'm getting at is maybe okay, I misunderstood. This thing here is 68 pages long. To me, as far as ethics goes, that's way too big. That's way too digging down uh, as deep as you can get. Yeah, I tried to give it a real simple thing, and yeah. and it got summarily killed. Well, that, that <laughs> should take over. Mr. Lambert. I do think that we should produce another type of booklet. That's the, the, the idea is to have everything relating to the ethics committee and ethics laws and rules in that book in one place. But that includes the procedural rules, which no one needs to look at unless you're the unfortunate party in a complaint. And it has two statutes, and it has the guidelines, a lot of which overlap and repeat. And so there should be something shorter that members should have with them. You'd mentioned uh, having um, 
work, and I have tried to work on that some, but, um, <laughs> but something much, much shorter, perhaps maybe only the guidelines and some summary of the gift provisions of 14C, which is something I do produce for orientation. But, and that's just a printout. It, there should be some sort of booklet that would be smaller uh, in format that, and, and the members could carry with them, which would tell them when they need to recuse, when they need to disclose, what's an illegal gift, that sort of thing. No, I don't disagree. I, I, um, I like the one page idea. Um, you know, I, we, we tried originally to whittle that down to one page and basically said, if you think it's a problem, it is. And, and if you're related to anybody that has, that this is causing you a reason to change your vote, that's a problem. Um, and both of those were summarily uh, tossed in the, in the waste can by the ethics committee. So um, I, I'm hard pressed to think that we're gonna come up with a solution that ha pleases everyone. I actually think what we are coming up to is, a, is and what we're creating, not only with the bill that we pass through uh, the House, but also this one, I think what we have is really something that they are going to use for adjudication purposes, not as something that is going to help our fellow legislators or even potential future legislators that are trying to figure out if they would have ethical issues coming here. I don't think that's somehow possible. Um, but but is there anything that, um, uh, let's just try to focus on this bill. Is there anything that, that we either need to research other than this IRS, the idea that it comes from the IRS and why, and, and, and whether that's providing us any teas. Um, I started telling you what I had for information. I can certainly give you the, um, this, the information I've been given, which is the um, uh, information from House Counsel who, who provide us the draft minutes of, of the Ethics Committee. Um, we also have, what else do we have, Jennifer? Um, Yep, the hearing report from the Senate, that was kind of, that was just uh, front and back of a piece of paper. Um, their hearing was um, one fifth of what our hearing just was. I mean, it, there was only one person that testified and it was Senator Susi, and, and they asked, I don't know, 10 questions, if that. So um, I, um, I don't know what other things that you would like to know about, um, but I'm happy to get you copies of any of that. You're in a you're in a unique position because you've already seen you've already had these arguments times two. Um, yeah, I you know looking at this bill at all, I I think they do try to bring us forward again. The focus of the bill is the organization for the purposes of recusal. So that's where this whole hierarchy thing comes in, and that helps to clarify some. I don't know if we're ever really going to get to where I we don't need to be. I, yeah. I mean, it's been years, <laughs> years of struggling with the legislature and the ethics committee to try to come up with simple definitions. You can't do this, you can't do that. And we can't quite put our finger on it. I think this comes closer. Uh, when you look at- The online. language is definitely simpler in this. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, but, but here again, we're already pointing to things in this um, that, well, why not the selectmen? You've gone, you know, you're exempting these people, but you're not exempting selectmen. Why, why not? Um, what? And one of the things that was brought up it was in terms of how much of the fact that you're paid to do a certain position. But a, a concern that Representative Kearney has, and I have as well, is the influence, the power, because selectmen have tremendous influence and power well, if they want to. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
and and I that's why I was trying to broaden it. It's selectmen is one example. Um, I you can't believe how much power in a in an area the fire chief has. Um, when you get down to all of the inspections of different things, um, it's enormous, much more so than a fire than a selectman, as far as I'm concerned. And not only that, if you do not have a building inspector, a code enforcement person, that's the fire chief. Right. They automatically. Well, this is what I'm. Automatically goes down to them. Well, this is what I'm saying. So it's not to to completely. This bill completely ignores that. Um. I think it, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it brings us forward, as I said, but we hadn't even thought of fire chiefs. In the, but you're right. And again, it's a hierarchy in each uh, municipality who has what power. Well, they're exempting these people. Yeah. But they didn't exempt fire chiefs. That's such. right. That's right. Um. But unlike Eric's uh, uh, district and uh, yeah, that uh, that makes more sense. That makes, and that covers everything going down from the Mallory's, the fire departments, the police departments, the water district, water everything. District, all those things suddenly just got picked up. Yeah. Don't forget, you also have the sewer commissioners. Who could forget the sewer commission? Come on, Allison. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's kind of what this is all about, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't, um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, are we headed to a committee of conference on this, do you think? Um, I, I think I think we're just not there yet. I'd love to know what Rich thinks. Sorry, Rich, don't mean to put No, I, I, I think he's having, I, I don't want to almost put him in the position to have but to do we this. Will be talking. But can I just say one thing? The Ethics Committee meets on Monday, and then on the agenda is discussion of these two bills, the two ethics bills. That's true. So Monday. One, one o'clock. Monday, I think I'll be in the audience until you go into non-public and I leave again. Probably there will be three non-public sessions before we get to. So it will be two o'clock? Maybe. Okay. Right, I could call you. <laughs> Unless I'm the, man, I'm the subject of one of those, I don't know. Um, but um, I don't. Uh, I I guess what I would like is for for all of you and anyone else that's listening uh, to offer ways of of um, either simplify. This is pretty simple. This part. But, but how do we express this to, if your colleague asks, what are you doing on ethics, what are you going to say to them? You know, how does, it seems that we have no limit to the number of questions, even, even the answers that someone has got in an opinion is turning back into more questions and coming back to ethics. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it it get it seemingly gets to even what your title is within an organization, um, and I don't know. It seem it didn't seem like our version of this dealt as much with the employer employee. I thought we handled that pretty well. The employer employee relationship. This seems to only deal with that employer employee relationship. Um, but not with, you know, if your brother is a contractor and you're in here loading on new roads and that's going to benefit him. This doesn't say anything about that. So I don't think of things that we need to do and communicate through Vanessa or I. Um, for now, I guess I'm going to ask Jen to just look at what that, if you can find out from Maybe Rick Lehman, what, what the um, the IRS portion of this and how it relates, and beyond that, is there any other suggestions anyone has? The only other thing I can say is uh, our bill is a must-do. 
What section of this is this pointing to? In other words, this says uh, 14C2, isn't it? 14C2? Or, and this uh, is 14 14C4. So I mean. No, no, no. I think it is 14C. I thought this was 14C2. It might be 14C4. They both want to. This creates new sections. Yeah. What did ours do? It didn't. It didn't. To the same section. To the same chapter. Yes. To the same chapter. Okay. Fourteen. Right. Or if, or if, right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming, and you get extra pay. You get all the pay of everybody that isn't here. Um, I am a little upset that our new member wasn't here. Well, I know, but you would think you were just appointed to a committee. You'd think you would be here. I hope she understands. Hope she's not down in 104 waiting for us or something. You know, I. Spare her off. What's that? Spare her off. 